Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome back to WT FFF. I'm Tracy Hazard and I'm here with Tom Hazard. And we're going to be talking about an all Tom Hazard episode. Now, sometimes we do episodes that are technical and Tom takes over. And this was one of them in our series. It was technical tips for creating 3D print textures. And it was a request from a, a listener. And I thought it was a gr it's a great one to, to follow our Project Captus introduction and where we really got to learn more about what was going on there with Josh, Josh St. John. And it's so amazing how much easier it might be now to create some of those things. Like I keep thinking about that it was as we were listening, as we were recording that episode. Certainly. You know, actually, Tracy, this is one of my favorite episodes that we recorded with WTFFF uh, in the past. Sorry about that because I know you weren't on it. Yeah, but okay. here's the thing. I kind of geek out on these tech things and when it comes to how to use your CAD files to achieve what you want to. And one of the things about 3D printing that's always been the case, and I think still is today, just about every different kind of 3D printer you could possibly use or buy, you know, to print your objects, there is a telltale sign in the surface quality of the part that speaks to how it was made, whether it's powder bed fusion of some kind or, you know, I think that resin goes beyond, or FFF, you know. That goes beyond 3D printing, though. I think you can tell when something's injection molded, rotationally molded. Like, I feel like all of our manufacturing techniques for the most part, have a sort of distinctive signature as to how they're made. A and now, quality to them, they might. It right. probably might take an engineer to really analyze and pick up, was this made this way or that way sometimes? We may not be able to, as a consumer, to identify it, but we have a quality sort of like understanding of that's what this is what rotationally molded toys are like, right? Or, or yeah, sure. garbage cans or whatever yeah, it is, right? We uh, have a sense of that, right. right? And so there is a sense of that with 3D printing as well. And that's something that you and I have worked on throughout our careers and probably you're more sensitive to it because I've been pushing you on surface textures. Because you? yeah, yeah, me. No. Yeah. It's because you know it's so important to me. But I love the idea of when we can transcend the manufacturing process of any kind, no matter what that is, whether it's 3D printing or injection molding, right? I want to transcend that and I don't want it to be obvious. I, I agree with you. And a surface texture is a wonderful way to really create a beautiful object that is not just a big billboard saying I was made this way. Right. And, and it, it really can, can transform an object to the point where, especially I think even in 3d printing, you may question, Hmm, how was that made? You know? And, and that's a good place to be. Cause that oh. says you're looking more at the beauty of the object or, you know, what it's meant to do than you are, how it was made. Well, and my, my favorite is when they go, what is that material? Like, how is that? What is that? Is it plastic? Is it metal? Like, I love it when they can't tell what the material is. That excites me even more. Then we've done a really good job of transcending the process and the material options of what we had to make it from, too. Sure. And, you know, while what we've been learning through this special series with HP is that there are new tools. We've talked about it some already, and we're going to talk about it some more in some upcoming episodes. There are new software tools. Things have advanced when it comes to textures and application of textures as it should have. The industry can, needed to continue to make improvements there, and it's been done so that now there may be a lot more easier ways to apply textures to a model you've created and not have to do it so much the hard way that I talk a bit about some of the, I guess, more technical, conventional, old school ways to create textures, surface textures in your models before 3D printing. Right. But the I Project Captus sounds like it's going to make it a whole lot easier for oh, you yeah. to like ca capture and figure out what that texture is and then re, you know, re-engineer that all over your part or, or put that apply in, apply it. it. Yeah. yeah. And so like, you know, that's fantastic that those things are there. But Tom and I thought that this episode was a good one to pull in for you because sometimes knowing exactly how to do something at it at its old school hard way gives you more insights into how to really apply it and utilize it to best achieve the ultimate goal, which is to create an object that people want, that people love, that they you know want to use or understand how to use if we're trying to make something functional, right? 
I would agree that way. I think some people listening may say, oh my gosh, these guys are really old school. They, you know, just use the new tools and don't worry about, you know, how you would have had to do it the hard way. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it probably, there are arguments to be made that, you know, there's value for each of those schools of thought. Uh, but I do tend to, just like I believe that if you're going to develop a quality product that has integrity, that meets all the goals of the manufacturer, the user, the market, and I'm forgetting something in there, but it, it just considers everything. Cost, needs of, to course, consider, right? oh, well, of course, right? <laughs> but that you've got to be intimately familiar with all the different manufacturing processes, their limitations, their pros, their cons, all these things in order to do a good job at that. And to me, I think all, similarly, even if you're going to use an advanced tool to apply textures, I think it's important to have a good understanding of what it takes to create them by hand or the hard way through CAD yourself in order to then uh, not only just appreciate what new software does, but to, able, to be able to use it in the most effective way and not have it actually cause problems and get in the way of well, what you're trying to do. Because sometimes we learn that the process we had to use to apply 3D print textures in the past were not the best ways. And now we can achieve even more textures and more techniques and more things that we couldn't do before, which allows us to actually go beyond that design in the design process, in the creative process, right? We find that all the time in manufacturing, right? When we're manufacturing something and we're, we're limited to, you know, the mold allows only these level of textures and these types of textures, we also have to be cognizant of that on our end when we're designing that we don't simulate something that we can't create, right? So thinking about those two things, that's, a, that's one of the reasons why we look at, can I deeply understand how I wanna create something, how it needs to be created, and that will also help me understand whether it's limited in its opportunity for printing it, in this case, 3D printing it, you know, or making it and manufacturing it ultimately. Is that possible? And does it do what, it, what it's supposed to do? Is it going to be textural enough, hide enough, create uh, crumb catchers like we used to call them. If you create them too deep, they create crumb, crumb catchers where you, where you catch dirt and crumbs. So we want to, you know, avoid those things. And so learning that at the, you know, from an old school and from a texture application uh, point of view is really helpful. And not only that, Tracy, you, you also want to remember that, you know, just because you can do something in 3D printing doesn't mean you should do it or doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to manufacture in another way in another process. So if you're designing a part that's going to be digitally manufactured forever, great use whatever's available to you in that process and don't worry about it. But Or seen only in virtual reality 3D, right? <laughs> right. But if eventually this is a part that's going to be injection molded or it's going to be, you know, thermoformed or it's going to be uh, machined out of, out of metal instead of 3D printed in metal, you've got to know, you know, how, what those limitations are and realize that, wow, you could create this beautiful texture but then if it's going to create an undercut or a problem in the mold, you're not actually going to be able to remove it from it. You know, so you've got still real world considerations for manufacturing. Yes, of course, you know, the consumer doesn't end up caring how something was manufactured at the end of the day. All they care about is, do they like the object? Is it attractive to them? Do they want it? And does it do what they expect it to do after they buy it? Ultimately, they don't care if it's injection molded or rotational molded or 3D printed. Really, it makes no difference. But, you know, you've got to make sure that you don't cause a problem by your lack of understanding of how some things might happen or how a texture might be applied. Anyway, I, I could go on and on for hours <laughs> talking about this. But this is why it's Tom's episode and we're going to talk about those technical tips. So why don't we go ahead and go to the episode where you answer the question on how to create 3D print textures. This is Tom on the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. I'm solo again today. Tracy's doing a lot of business travel lately. So I hope it's all right with all of you that it's just me again today. Tracy will be back again soon. The subject is surface textures, and this is written in by Casey Snyder. And Casey, I appreciate you writing in. So Casey writes, throwing out there an idea for a show topic that many people might benefit from. The idea of adding subtle or maybe shallow surface textures to 3D models for 3D printing. 
Casey is really looking for methods that would preserve an object's basic geometry. And Casey primarily uses SolidWorks and would love to be able to neural, fish scale, dimple, etc. over curved and irregular surfaces. Casey realizes it might be a tall order in SolidWorks and has attempted surface textures in Mudbox and Blender, but feels it's too uncontrolled. And it always tends to alter the part in ways that were unintended. So the idea here is to break up the layer lines, the visible vertical layer lines on a part, but ideally still maintain the core geometry. So it's actually a really good question and an issue that Casey's having. I've had the same issue many times myself, and I'm sure many of our listeners had. So I'm going to tell you just what I've done from my perspective, and I've had the exact same issue, and this is a tough one. Let's talk about knurling, first of all, because knurled surfaces are pretty unique in the world of geometry. And for those of you that don't know, knurling is a way to create a sort of a diamond patterned grip surface, usually done on metal, although I've seen it molded on plastic, but it's a process that has existed as long as really metal lathes have existed. There's an actual tool called a knurling tool. It's quite fascinating because if you turn a piece of metal and let's say you want to have a handle on the end and the, the easiest example I can think of is if you've ever used a vice grip plier type tool, the vice grip brand, you know, there are others that are not their brand, but that's, I guess, the most easy example I can think of of a knurled surface. And if you don't have one next time you're in Home Depot or Lowe's or any hardware store, you can find one. A vice grip is an adjustable plier, has an adjustable grip of a plier made of stainless steel of some kind. And they have this screw in one of the handles that you can adjust in or out to change that adjustable grip range of the pliers. And at the very bottom of that, what you actually turn has a bit of a diamond pattern grip on it. And that is a knurled surface and it's formed with a tool called a knurler. The idea is that big screw is a screw machine part. It's produced on a lathe. They'll cut the threads in it and then have this little pronounced handle at the bottom. And that starts out as just a flat radius surface. But this knurler tool, which has two different wheels on it, they're really a cutting tool and a forming tool in one. And if you push it in as the part is rotating slowly on the lathe, you push the knurler into it. And it simultaneously sort of cuts and digs into that surface and sort of reforms that steel into kind of a diamond-shaped pattern, which makes it grip really easily. And obviously the intention was to make a surface that's easy to grip. Now, when it comes to creating something like that in a 3D printed part, it's a little different because obviously we're not forming material as it's rotating in the same way. You have to actually create it in geometry. And here is where... You have to be much more precise in creating your geometry than you would using a knurling tool. So it's an interesting example, and it's part of why I wanted to talk about this today, is that there are many things that have been created in standard manufacturing since the Industrial Revolution, the first Industrial Revolution, that are manufacturing methods, decoration methods, manipulation of material methods that are built around how things are traditionally made, in this case, a lathe-turned part. And the knurler is fascinating because no matter what diameter of part you want to knurl, no matter how large or small that diameter is, the knurler tool will work every time. And it's not something you program into a process to make sure it all matches up. It just does it. And it's hard to explain why that is. It's sort of a fascinating aspect of physics and geometry and manufacturing. But when we need to make something like that and 3D print it, you have to predetermine that pattern and the 3D printer has to just actually go make the geometry. So it's an entirely different process. It's much more difficult to get that repeating pattern to repeat perfectly around the circumference of the part. Let's say in this case, you're going to do a round cylindrical type of part with that kind of texture. You have to predetermine that and make sure that that diamond pattern will absolutely match up and have consistent gaps and distances with no overlapping when you get around that entire 360 degrees of the part. And it's not always easy. You've got to know what your circumference is, design your diamond pattern, three-dimensional diamond pattern to actually mate up perfectly around there, around that distance, and then 
create some geometry that you're going to probably use a tool like an array or a revolve tool or, you know, there's a number of different tools you can use to achieve this in CAD. But you're going to either cut into or, or add to a three-dimensional surface in that pattern you want. So it's an entirely different process, and it's not easy. It's not like you can just go and, oh, hey, I've made this cylindrical surface. Go add a knurled surface. And maybe some of the programs out there, some of the maybe higher-end CAD programs, especially ones where you can specify threads and say, all right, I want an M6 thread on this part, and it's going to know what to do to make that thread or any, any one of the standard thread sizes you can do. I don't know if any of them do knurled surfaces the same way they may because it's such a common thing. But let's say for a moment that they don't have that automated. It's a hard thing to go and model in geometry. You're probably better off. What I would do in that case of making a knurled surface, I would make my cylinder what I want. I would probably use either a helix or a spiral geometry tool to create a curved path that is in a spiral formation. A spiral is probably the right one. And you can define the number of turns that spiral does around the object and then over a given height distance. And then I would take a V-shaped or triangular-shaped two-dimensional shape and then extrude it or Extruding may not be the right term for following a path. Different programs call it different things. I use rhinoceros primarily, so that would be sweeping a rail with a certain shape. And it would create this V surface in an object that is a continual spiraled extrusion of a triangular shape or a V shape. You'd have the point going in toward the center of the cylindrical object that you want to cut away from. And then, you know, if you make that you may have to adjust where your shape is relative to the path you're sweeping it on or extruding it along, but you can get it so that you're going to cut into the cylinder you're doing. And so you can do that with a spiral in one direction and then a spiral in the other direction to crisscross it and create your diamond shape pattern. It's going to be a multi-step process. It's not something that's going to work really well in your parametric programs like SOLIDWORKS. So, Casey, I, I hate to tell you this, but the way of parametric programs and how they work they're not really made to handle this type of operation in an easy way when you're creating something in your mind's eye from scratch. They definitely would want it to be some kind of a program or script that's going to somehow define this geometry that you want to create and you know have it be something programmed in. You really need it to be a tool that already exists to do this type of thing. So I don't use parametric programs very often for this exact reason because some of the forms shapes and textures I want to create are not that easily defined in parametric programs. I would be beating my brains out if I tried to do it all the time. So creating something in more of a program like Rhinoceros or even Blender or some of these other programs that allow more free-form geometry creation would be easier to do it in, but it's still going to be a very manual process. There are a few programs that can help you do it in an automated way, but there are a few. So now moving away from knurling, let's just talk about some of the other things. Like let's say you want a dimple texture, like you wanted to make a golf ball and have dimples on a golf ball or any other really overall textured surface. Mudbox actually is a really good tool to do that. And I have tried it. I actually have Mudbox and that's what I would do. I would create my geometry in one program, bring it into another like Mudbox and apply a surface texture to it. And there are ways to do it so that you don't alter the underlying geometry, but it's still not easy. And I know certainly there are ways you can mess up your underlying geometry. But here's the other problem you're going to have is once you bring it into Mudbox, if you want to bring it back into SolidWorks, I believe you lose all your parametric properties at that point. So exporting something from SolidWorks into a Mudbox program or Rhinoceros or other program, you're going to be taking what is very smart geometry and making it dumb. That's sort of what we call it. You're going to be making it into a dumb solid in order to do the surface texture modification to it. So you really need to have completely finished all of your geometry in the parametric program. And then the, the very end process is what you want to be doing the texture in. You don't want to be having to then go back and do other things to it. So if I were you and I were doing something like this, completely finish designing or engineering your part in SOLIDWORKS, save that file in SOLIDWORKS because you may need it again to do a different texture or 
If you take the texture too far and hurt it, you're going to need to export it again. And then make that be the last step in the process, putting a texture on it and go right to STL for 3D printing. That kind of process makes sense. It's like a one-way street, though. You really are not going to be able to come back. But I have another example, not to push Rhinoceros, it's just what I have the most experience in. And Rhinoceros is a program that there are a lot of companies that write and make plugins for it. And I actually purchased a plugin, pretty darned expensive one, I'm afraid to say. It was about $1,000, which is craziness unless you're a professional. But there's a plugin called Rhino Emboss, E-M-B-O-S-S. And I bought that plugin specifically to do this exact thing. Take geometry that I had created and then apply textures to it. And you can apply any kind of texture you can imagine by using a 2D image like a JPEG or something of a texture. Any photograph that you like, you can load it in and sort of almost like project it over the top of an object you've made and you can mask off areas you don't want to be affected and essentially paint, if you will, or draw with a brush or whatever in the areas that you want the texture to be applied. And you can choose if you want it to be embossed or debossed or in another way, if you want it to be added texture away from the surface you've created or if you want it to cut in, basically making something convex or concave, you can choose and decide that. But it allows you to create really very unlimited kinds of textures. And, and I think Mudbox does a similar thing. I think also ZBrush I've seen has that same kind of functionality. But again, it's not in the world of parametric modeling. Again, it's in every case, every example that I know of that I've used, it's going to be an end-use process. It's, a, like I said, a one-way street. So you, you don't want to do that until you believe you don't have any other modifications you need to make to your part because it's, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to do that after the fact. So Rhino and Boss, lots of great tools for manipulation, creating relief structures. That's what really we're talking about in the world. And, you know, I come from the art and design world, even though I do engineering of things. It, I'm not a degreed engineer, but in the art and design world, we're talking about relief here, which is really relief have existed as long as art has in the form of sculpture and you're talking about pushing and pulling material creating different shapes and patterns and all kinds of different details so you can create relief in many different ways with certain different programs applying interpretation of 2d images to create three-dimensional geometry and you can change the degree of depth to which it goes and how hard or soft it's created. You can change the scale of these patterns. And that's the best way that I've found. But here's the thing. It takes some work to learn how to do it. But if you really want to create 3D printed parts that are built layer by layer and completely disguise those layers, it's really the best way to do it. And applying it to your vertical faces or surfaces that exist on your part, especially if you're making, you know, a nice object like, let's say you're making a lampshade. And if I was making a golf ball, for instance, I would create the pattern of dimples. I would just actually use standard commands in CAD program. I wouldn't be using a texture interpreted from a 2D image and projected onto it because dimples are probably a little easier because you can do a polar array around something that's round or even spherical of a pattern that is a half drop repeat. It's been a while since I looked at a golf ball this close up, but I think golf ball dimple shape is kind of a bit of a half drop repeat that is repeated radially around the sphere of a golf ball. And I think it's an actual definable, repeatable pattern that you can do. So if you're going to do anything that has that kind of definition, create the three-dimensional shapes that you either want to add or subtract from another object and use a command like an array, either rectangular or polar, creating that repeated pattern and then use a Boolean operation to add it or subtract it from what you're doing. That's really the only other way. And really using SOLIDWORKS, that's going to be probably the most practical way to try to do it, especially if you want to maintain all of your constraints and your sort of smart geometry. But I'd be interested to know once you did that in a SOLIDWORKS or even Inventor, or, you know, all these other programs that 
use parametrics. Once you create that dimpled pattern, if you ended up making the part larger, I wonder if it might actually stretch the dimples and they don't think it's going to create more for you. So these are the complexities and the challenges with parametric modeling versus other kinds of modeling. And this also really points out the main reason why there are so many different CAD programs out there. There's not one absolute right or wrong way to make an object. And the more engineering type programs are wonderful for creating geometry simply and being able to make changes in that geometry without having to rebuild the whole part. But you're running up against where they become limited. And it's more on the artistic pattern decoration side of things that they tend to fall a little short or just are not able to achieve some of the same things as the more artistic programs. And then you have the more artistic programs. ZBrush, as an example, way on the far end of artistic, you can create all kinds of wonderful organic textures and shapes, but you can't be very specific in that program other than generally how big or small something is. You, you're not going to have a great degree of precision. And if you need to make a change to something, you may have to largely remake a large part, if not the entire part. So there are pros and cons to every software. That's why I don't think there's a good or a bad software out there. It's just in terms of CAD creation, there's just different kinds and different programs have better capabilities or not so great capabilities in certain areas. And it really depends on what you're trying to make. We always say on WTFFF, it's all about the what, what the FFF do you want to make? And then knowing that ahead of time will help you out. It, it doesn't help you a lot if you've spent a whole lot of time, though, learning SOLIDWORKS, don't know these other programs so well, and then you need to do more less geometrically rigid creations because you're going to have to learn another program or at least learn enough of it to use it. But, you know, you can do that. I use Photoshop, probably about 5% of all the tools in Photoshop I use. Um, but I use them for what I need to and I've learned how to do it and that's it. I don't try to do everything within Photoshop when I'm working with images. Similar kind of thing. I've got a couple different CAD programs and I use some more than others. just depends on what I'm making. So, Unfortunately, I don't have the absolute silver bullet. Here's the absolute answer for you, Casey. I'm sorry about that. I wish I did. But it's a great question. It's a great discussion. And you know what? There's probably some new tools out there I don't even know about. I mean, we're always looking at new softwares. We're always trying them out, reviewing them from time to time. And I don't know everything that's out there. But if there's something better out there, I bet one of our listeners knows and I'd love to hear about it. So please share with us. As I said before, there will be a blog post for this episode on 3dstartpoint.com. By the time you're listening to this, it is titled 3D Printed Surface Textures. And uh, come check it out. And if you've got you know, what you think is the best way to do it, or even if it's not the best way, it's just a way to do it, or reach out to us anywhere on social media at 3D Start Point. So thanks so much for listening. Hope this episode was helpful. We'll talk to you next time. This has been Tom on the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF Special Series brought to you by the Z and 3D Print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D. 